Hi everyone, and my name is Yan Fu Chen, and I come from National Chen Kong University in Taiwan. And today's my presentation is about a secure and efficient risk by based simulator. And this is today's agenda. Okay. So first, I will introduce our motivation. So initially, we want to find a risk by based simulator for computer architecture curves. But some but because the risk by CPU is not easy to access. But some existing risk by based simulator like QEMU or Spike is too complex to be a teaching material. So we decided to construct a compact and efficient simulator from scratch. And the compact means small and simple. But and we control the total project size and make it more readable for students. However, the compact also means slow. So our another goal is to improve the performance of simulator and lower its memory usage. And furthermore, we implemented a baseline just-in-time compiler to further improve the performance of our simulator. Okay. And this page summarizes our achievement. We choose two popular open source risk by simulator to compare our performance. And for interpreter only design, the comparing target is spike. And, uh, and our performance is outperforms the spike in all cases. And our project is RV32 EMU. And for the just in time compiler, our comparing target is QEMU. And unlike the dynamic binary translation of QEMU, we don't need to write any assembly code when integrating the just in compiler. And nevertheless, our performance is very close to QEMU and even outperforms it in some cases. And our project also supports for RV32 IM ACF extension and several SDL based system calls for running video games. And we also support for remote GDB debugging. Okay. And this page shows some classic PC game can run smoothly on our simulator. And next, I will introduce the detail of our design. But before that, I want to share our design concept. And the first design concept is we want to improve the performance of our simulator. So we utilize some techniques of modern compiler and we make some improvement based on the risk by architecture property and modern computer architecture view. And the second concept is we want to realize the tier just in time compilation. So for just for tier just in time compilation, we may have an interpreter, tier one just in time compiler, and tier two just in time compiler. So we need a profiler to collect the profiling data for launch the just-in-time compilation process. And the profiler in our simulator is the interpreter. And we also need a baseline just-in-time compiler to evaluate the effectiveness of integrating the just-in-time compiler. So I will introduce our baseline just-in-time compiler later. And because we save the storing, we save the profiling data and the memory usage of providing data may increase during emulation. So we also have some strategy to lower the memory usage. And the last concept is we want to create a secure sandbox execution environment. So we keep our design of interpreter simple and make it execute securely with our runtime generated machine code. Okay. So and in this, in this page, I will explain the reason why our simulator mode can make the secure execution. And the first reason is simplicity. Because the implementation of our interpreter is relatively simple and we keep all components as straightforward. So the simplicity enhances the security by reducing the attack surface. And the second reason is unlike the dynamic binary translation or just in time compilation. The interpreter makes secure execution without invoking runtime generating machine code. So the attacker cannot attack our interpreter mode 
with changing the runtime generating machine code, but they can do so in dynamic binary translation or just-in-time compilation. And the third reason is we make comprehensive testing procedure across all aspects of the module within interpreter system. So that's the reason why our interpreter can make secure execution. And also, the interpreter serves as the profiler in our simulator. So the interpreter mode is very important for our simulator. Okay, so next I will introduce the architecture of our interpreter. First, we have a ELF loader. And ELF loader loads the user RISC-V program compiled by RISC-V tool chain. Then we have two main modules. First is block translation module, and the second is block emulation module. Block translation module emulates the stage of instruction fetching, instruction decoding, and instruction dispatching. And we divided the ELF file into several basic blocks. So the decoding information from instruction decoding and the emulation function from instruction dispatching are stored in, in the basic block data structure. And after the translation, we pass the basic block data structure to the block emulation module. And block emulation module emulates the stage of instruction execution. So the block emulation module simply invokes the emulation function from the instruction dispatching. And the parameter of emulation function is decoding function. Okay. And next, I will introduce some technique we use to improve our performance. And the first technique is tail call optimization. So if your recursive function have the same number of parameter and the same parameter type and same function return type, you can launch the tail call optimization. And when invoking the recursive function, tail call optimization eliminates the need for the creation of new function stack frame. And we can reuse the current function stack frame to SQ next function. So we can see the example below. In the first example, we don't launch the tail call optimization in this recursive function. So we can see from this instruction sequence, we need to maintain the stack pointer register to create a new function stack frame. And we use the call instruction. Call instruction recall the return address and jump to the next function. By contrast, in the second example, we launch the tail call optimization with a compiler hint. So in this instruction sequence, we don't need to maintain any register pointer. We don't need to maintain any stack pointer register. We directly jump to the next function. So the tail call optimization helps us to save the overhead of creating new function stack frame. And to launch the tail call optimization, we rewrite our emulation function into self recursive version and introduce a compiler hint. So with this modification, all the emulation function within the base block can reuse the same function stack frame to execute. And we can see the example below is our emulation function about a NOP instruction. And in this instruction sequence, we don't need to maintain any stack pointer register. And we don't need to recall the return address. We just directly jump to the next emulation function here. And the second technique to improve the performance is block chaining. Block chaining connects the basic block along an execution path. And it significantly improves the performance of locating next block. So for example, after we emulating a basic block, we need to back to the translation module from emulation module, then finding or translating the next basic block and back to the emulation module. However, we want to save the overhead of switching between emulation module and translation module. So we, that's the reason why we implemented the block training. And in the end of a basic block, the instruction must be a branch instruction or jump instruction. And we divided this instruction into two categories. The first category is direct jump and branch. Because the target of direct jump and branch is constant, so we can simply change the previous block to the current block. And the second category is indirect jump. 
because the jump target of indirect jump is determined by register value, so it is inconstant. And we implemented a branch history table. If we can locate the next block in a branch history table, we directly jump to it. But if not, we should back to the emulation uh, translation module. And we can see from this example. So after we emulating this basic block, we can get the branch result, maybe branch taken or branch untaken. So if branch taken, we can directly jump to this basic block. And if branch untaken, we can directly jump to this base block in the emulation module. So the blockchain itself, the overhead of switching emulation, switching between the emulation module and translation module. Okay. And the third technique is macro operation fusion. And macro operation fusion is a common technique in modern compiler design. So how does the macro operation benefit our simulator? The reason is our simulator is a functional simulator. So it only care about the final result. It don't care about the process of emulation. So we can create a field function to emulate several instructions with a function code. For example, if we want to emulate three instructions, we need to invoke the emulation function three times previously. But with the macro operation fusion, if we want to emulate three instructions, we can invoke a field function to emulate these three instructions. So the macro operation fusion saves the overhead of function code. And we referred the reports on macro operation fusion for risk five and examines the instruction pattern of our benchmarks. And finally, we choose several candidates across frequency. And this table shows the candidate we choose. And for example, the first candidate is AUIPC instruction and ADDI instruction. In the, in the risk by architecture, if you want to create a constant, you need a AUIPC instruction and ADDI instruction. And for the pro function prolog and function f log of risk by architecture, you need continuous lower and continuous lower. So that's the reason why this instruction pattern occurs frequently. Okay, and this table shows the dynamic instruction count with and without the macro operation fusion. And the first column is our benchmark. And the second column is the dynamic instruction count without the macro operation fusion. And this is the dynamic instruction count with the macro operation fusion. And this is the reduction in the in dynamic instruction count. We can see from the next column, the macro operation fusion effectively reduced the number of instructions to be executed. And this also means the number of function calls we save. Okay. And the next strategy to improve the performance is C routine substitution because our benchmark are generating from the compilation of C program. So some standard library function like memory carpet and memory set occurs frequently. And we observe that the instruction sequence of this standard library function is constant if your program are compiled by the same OS and the same compiler. So we recorded the instruction sequence as reference target and substitute as it if the pattern match. So we can gain the performance from this because emulating while standard library function is much slower than directly invoking the whole standard library function. Okay, and the next strategy to improve the performance is manipulating frequently updated CPU state by register. And during the emulation, we keep updating the emulating CPU state, including program counter, CPU cycle, register value, and so on. And especially the program counter and CPU cycle should be updated every time we emulate an instruction. And these two variables stored in a emulated CPU state data structure. So the reference of the program counter and CPU cycle need a memory operation. From modern architecture view, the overhead of memory operation is heavy than register operation. To solve this, we pass the program counter 
and CPU cycle as parameter for emulation function. And we only update that in the end of the emulation. And we can see the example below. The left side is the original version and right side is the modified version. In the original version, to add, in the, to add instruction to update the CPU cycle and program counter is a memory operation. But in the modified version, to add instructions to update the CPU cycle and program counter is register operation. So we can gain the performance, performance improvement from this because register operation is faster than memory operation. Okay. And we also have some strategy to reduce the memory usage and footprint because we store the providing data like basic block data structure. And the number of basic block data structure would increase during the emulation. And to limit the total number of basic block, we introduce a block cache. And we implemented three different cache replacement policy to evaluate its performance. And LRU is the first press, LFU is the second press, and the last is adaptive replacement cache. Because its, repass, its replacement policy algorithm is too complex. But finally, we choose the LFU policy because of the just-in-time compilation. And in the just-in-time compilation, we need to detect the hash bar. And in the LFU cache, we record the frequency, using frequency of a basic block. So we can use it to detect the hash bar. If the using frequency of a basic block exceeds the predetermined threshold, we launch the just-in-time compilation process. So that's the reason why we choose LFU catch finally. And also, we have some strategy to limit the memory footprint. So we introduce a memory pool, and this memory pool manages the deallocation and the allocation of basic block data structure. OK, so next I will show the experimental result of our interpreter. And this is our benchmark. And we can see this is the percentage of the LU instructions. And this is the percentage of memory I.O. instruction. And it may be lower or store instruction. And this is the percentage of branch instruction. Maybe indirect drum, direct drum, or branch. And this is the dynamic instruction count of the benchmark. OK, so this figure shows the normalized execution time of spike and RB32 EMU. And we can see from this figure, the performance of our project outperforms spike in all cases, especially in the Mandelbrot benchmark and price benchmark. And the reason is because the branch, the branch instruction percentage in this benchmark is high. So the block chaining effectively enhances the performance of locate, locating that basic block and jump to it in the emulation module. We save the overhead of switching between translation module and emulation module. However, we can see the SHA benchmark. In this benchmark, the performance of our project is very close to spike. And this is because the percentage of branch instruction in this benchmark is only 1%. OK. So here I summarize the strategy in interpreter. So the performance of our interpreter outperforms spike. And to improve the performance, we apply telco optimization, block chaining, macro operation fusion, C routine substitution, and manipulate frequently updating CPU state by register. And for reducing the memory usage and footprint, we introduce LFU cache and memory pool. Okay, so next, I will introduce our baseline just-in-time compiler. And before implement, implement the tiered compilation, we need to uh, baseline just-in-time compiler to evaluate our performance of integrated just-in-time compiler. And the baseline means we want to use minimal effort to implement it. We don't want to write any assembly code 
and we don't want to modify the design of interpreter. Okay. So the concept of just-in-time compiler is we want to lower the emulation overhead. We want to create an emulation function, emulates all the instruction along a hard execution path. So you can image we want to create a very huge fused function. And all the variable in the emulation function can be replaced with the constant value because we have the decoding information in code generation stage. So with this replacement, the compiler can make further optimization to generate it, optimize it machine code. And the second concept is our just-in-time compiler only for hotspot because the overhead of runtime code generation and compilation is significant. So if we launch the just-in-time compiler for core execution paths, the overhead of code generation and compilation and runtime may always the benefits. Okay. And this is the implementation of our baseline just-in-time compiler. For interpreter, we have implemented the block chaining and LFU catch. So for the baseline just-in-time compiler, we, on, we only need to add three additional module. The first is code generation module. And we trace the trendy block pack and pass the emulation module, and it pass the emulation function and decoding information to the code generator. And code generator generates the C code like this is simple. This is the program counter of the current instruction. And this is the program counter of the next instruction. Between this label, this C code is emulation function. Originally, the register value or the immediate in the emulation function is variable. But in code generation stage, we have decode, decoding information. So we can replace this value, this variable with the constant value. And compiler can make through the optimization. And for example, compiler can make constant propagation or constant floating. And after we generating this C call, we should have an integrated compiler to compile them. And the compiler we integrated here is clean. We pass the C call to the clean, and clean compile the C call to the machine code. And this machine code is a fused function to emulate the, all the instruction within a hard execution path. And and after the client generated the machine call, we store this machine call into a call cache for future use. And the example below is the workflow of our just-in-time compiler. So the LFU cache records the using frequency of the basic block. And if we detect a using frequency of a basic block exceeds the predetermined threshold, we launch the just-in-time compiler process. And just in compiler, trace the trending block and pass the emulation function and decoding information to the C code generator. And C code generator generate the C code like the example above. And we pass this C code to the client. Then client compile the C code. And we add C code into machine code. And we store this machine code into the call cache for future use. And this is the architecture after integrated the just-in-time compiler. The upper part is interpreter design. The lower part is just-in-time compiler. And we can see from this figure, we don't need to modify the design of interpreter when integrated the just-in-time compiler. Okay, and this figure also shows the normalized time of QEMU and rb 32 emu because the comparing target of just in compiler is QEMU. And we can see from this figure, the performance of our just in compiler is very close to QEMU in some case, in most cases. And we even outperform it in some cases like FP emulation and stream. However, however in some cases like price or big field, the performance of our simulator is much slower than QEMU. And that's because we cannot 
detect the specific hotspot in this benchmark. So the Justinang compiler are not be in, are not invoked in these two benchmarks. And that's the reason why the performance of RV32 EMU is much lower than QEMU in these two benchmarks. And it is also the disadvantage of our baseline Justinang compiler design. Because the Justinang compiler only launch when we detect the specific hotspot. Okay, and in addition to the instruction set simulator RV32 EMU, we have another system emulation project simu. As shown in this video, the after Linux kernel, risk five Linux kernel can run smoothly on the CMU without any code change. And CMU also supports for memory management uni environment and supports for virtual IO or virtual GPU. Considering the development, we separate the instruction set simulator RV32 EMU and system simulator CMU into two projects. But recently, we plan to integrate them. Okay. So in conclusion, our project RV32 EMU is a compact and efficient open source simulator. And it has a fast interpreter and baseline just in time compiler. Moreover, it only implemented in about 10,000 C code. This project is relatively simple and small, and its performance is acceptable. There are some ongoing tasks like tiered compilation and supports for risk v vector extension. So if you have any interest in our project, you can scan this QR code or contact this email. Thank you. So I have two questions. One is you mentioned about security. Oh, okay. And you, you talked about you, you mentioned about security, but you did not talk that much about security, oh, right? Yeah, yes, yes. So can you tell us a little bit more about security? Okay. And the main security of our interpreter is big. The main security issue of, about our simulator is because in the QEMU, it uses dynamic binary translation. And for the Justin, for Justin and compilation, and they also need a runtime generated machine code. And the attacker can change the runtime generated machine code to attack you. But in our interpreter, we don't invoke the runtime generated machine code. So the execution of interpreter is relative secure. So the just-in-time compilation in your system does yeah. not happen runtime? I, I didn't get it. Uh, yeah, I, and because the just-in-time compilation more also have the secure issue. So yeah. if you, you are care about the secure, you uh -huh. can close the just-in-time compiler oh, I see, I see. in our big configuration. I see, okay, thank okay. you. Yes. And uh, one more question if it, uh, anyone doesn't have one. So you talk about CPU cycles, right? Yes. So you intend to present the CPU cycle to the user so that the user can see it? And if use, user want to get the CPU cycle, you can print this information. Right. Yeah, but the problem is that you do not emulate the cache and memory, so the CPU cycle may not mean anything because yes, you and, don't count like memory yeah, stores. And because right? we emulate a single cycle CPU, uh -huh. so it, it may complete all things in a cycle. Uh -huh. So all the stage of instruction fetching, instruction decoding, instruction dispatching, and instruction execution complete, and we count one cycle. Uh, so so this you, is now a perform, performance model. I see. So if you assume single cycle CPU, yes. that CPU cycle is correct, like accurate. Yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks for the presentation. Then I have two questions about the host systems. 
So as far as I remember, you showed the results on the x86 platform running the uh, emulation. Yes. So do you have any plan to support the other uh, architectures like ARM or RISC-V? Oh, okay, we, we have the experimental result on the ARM host machine and the figure is in our, our theory and not showing here. Yes, so if you want, I can provide you later. So and then the, the other question is the uh, dependence on the host CPU cache size. So if the uh, interpreter uh, core code or JIT compiled code can be fit in the uh, cache line, so that will be a great performance improvement, I guess. So do you see any cache size dependency? Okay. And so for the cache size, we make some experiment, experiment in the cache size. And finally, we choose 100 little, uh, 1000 little 24 for the cache size. And this is the experiment result, experimental result. Yes. Okay, I see. Good. Okay, thank you. So you talked a lot about what you've done so far, but you haven't talked so much about what's next for this. Okay. Okay, and what you go next is the tiered compilation. And the tiered compilation, we have the, we, we now we only have a baseline just in time compiler and but the runtime code generation and compilation of clan is so, the, the compile time for clan is so long. So we want to integrate a tier one compiler. The, tier com the compile time of tier time compiler is short, but the quality of its machine code is not good. But because it's wrong, its compile time is short, so we can translate the basic block to the host machine code as soon as possible. And if we find this machine code invoked by, invoke by the tier one compiler frequency, we can use the tier two compiler. And the compile time of tier two compiler is long, but the quality of the machine code is very good. It made more optimization on this, on this C, uh, generated C code, yes. Are, are you expecting that that's, a hard, that's going to be a hard thing to implement? Difficult thing to implement? Yes, because we want because it is too difficult to find a runtime compiler and its uh, its compile time is short. So maybe so now we still finding that. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, I have a one question. Uh, in your JIT comp in your just-in-time compiler, uh, how do you do uh, C code generation? Use libraries or handmade? Oh, oh, it just use a uh, string string library, and we use string string cat to create a string, and the content of string is the C code. Yes, and we pass this string to the client, and client compile it to machine code. Yes. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Uh, okay, thank you. Thank you, everyone.